is Wayne Kramer. Thanks. Uh, uh, it's a, an honor to uh, be asked to come here and spend some time with you guys and uh, talk about what little I know about uh, a life in the arts and uh, life in these United States. And as this class is focused on uh, pop music and uh, how we ended up here today and how we connect the dots back to how we got here. Um, how many people were at the forum last night? So you guys know a little bit about me. And, and I'm curious to know how many people ever heard of the rock band, the MC5? Terrific. Um, and I'm not surprised if you haven't heard of the MC5. The MC5 was a band I started in the 60s in Detroit, where I was born and grew up. And uh, a lot of people blame the MC5 or credit the MC5 for punk rock and heavy metal music. Um, if you never heard of the MC5, I'm not surprised because the MC5 was never a hit band. We never had platinum albums and uh, we never had big radio hit singles because we were banned from the radio. We had a song that was one of our more popular songs and um, uh, the introduction to the song was part of the performance and the introduction was kick out the jams motherfuckers. That never made it to the radio. <laughs> it's, it's hard to figure that in by today's standards, because every hip hop band and every rap group and every rock group, everybody has to say that word. It's, you have to say it, or else you, you're not credible. Uh, but in the 60s, uh, America was uh, more clamped down than it is now, and it's pretty clamped down now. And, uh, but you know, we weren't. Um, completely naive. We knew that Kick Out the Jams, motherfucker, would never be a hit single. So we did record another version of it where the intro was Kick Out the Jams, Brothers and Sisters. Even that wasn't enough. That, that song alone uh, basically got us a drop from our record label and kicked out of the record business. Um, we also had a commitment to revolutionary change in America. And this is the era of the Vietnam War, the era of the Civil Rights Movement, the era of uh, almost unimaginable upheaval in this country. Hard to feature by today's understanding, the way maybe you guys grew up. To, it, I, I know it, you can't really get a grip on what it was like, um, but it was a terribly polarizing time. And the difference was, young people and older people. That was the, the line in the sand. And back then, I know it's hard to imagine, but I was young. I had hair. And like all my contemporaries, we drew a line in the sand that said the older generation is dead wrong about everything, and we're absolutely correct about everything. Um, I, I don't feel that way today so much. You know, I, I used to be certain about everything, and I, I'm not so certain about everything today. And uh, uh, I was convinced uh, that I was going to live forever. I would be the exception to the idea of dying. You all were going to die, but I wouldn't die. Today, I don't believe that either. I'm pretty sure I'm going to die. So I know less about more things today than I did when I was younger. Um, and that's probably the prerogative of youth. That's the enthusiasm of youth, and it's necessary, because otherwise you wouldn't have the energy to get out there in the world and try and make something happen or make something of yourself. Uh, so to look at the, the pop music of that day, what, what was happening, you know, rock and roll came out of um, if, if you 
say we pick it up around the era, the end of the big bands, like my parents' generation, and they were all, uh, you know, Tommy Dorsey and uh, uh, the big dance bands were the Ray World War II, you know, how probably for you guys, grandma and grandpa's music. Um, that was their music, and that music set them apart from their parents. But my generation was the rock generation, and what the music that we created and we like set us apart from our parents' generation. Then your generation came along, and you guys are set apart from my generation. This is Dr. Charles Moore, my partner and colleague, and uh, partner in crime, yes. Wonderful jazz composer and, and musician. And we've been friends and partners for 40 years. So uh, coming out of the early rock era, you know, the, uh, the Elvis Presley era, you know, where, where the, the big band music kind of morphed into this smaller group and the coming of popular radio, uh, Patti Page and uh, all those kind of artists, that, Frank Sinatra, that kind of the leftovers of the 40s era and into this kind of new sound that was more beat oriented. Uh, the chords were less sophisticated, the melodies less sophisticated than the big band era. And then out of that comes our generation, my generation, which was the rock generation, really kind of started with the, um, for me anyway, the instrumental bands of the, of the early 60s, the, the Ventures, uh, Johnny and the Hurricanes, those kinds of bands, Dick Dale. Uh, as a guitar player, as a 12, 13-year-old guitar player, those were the bands I listened to. And um, then with the coming of the first wave of the British invasion, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, um, in my neighborhood in Detroit, you know, this was a Detroit that's not the Detroit of today, but the Detroit of uh, late 50s, early 60s, where everybody had good jobs. And you could buy an electric guitar and an amp at Sears on credit. And my neighborhood in, in Lincoln Park, a working class suburb of Detroit, literally had kids with electric guitars all over the place. You know, you've heard of um, garage music. Well, that's because that's where we played. We played in the garage. The parents said, get that noise out of the house, play it in the garage. And then, you know, you'd play in the garage and kids in the neighborhood would ride over on their bikes and say, hey, there's a band playing over here. Those were the first gigs. We were, we were garage bands. Uh, and it was the birth of the rock music world that um, we, we all are part of today. Um, you know, uh, the MC5, we made our first album in 1968, and this whole movement that I was talking about, you know, the anti-war movement, this rebellion against our parents' generation, something we thought we were unique in. And I don't know if you think that your generation and your music is unique. Y you may, and that would be natural, but every generation thinks their music is unique. I'm sure when Beethoven came out, Everyone that liked Beethoven said, yeah, our stuff is really revolutionary and unique, unlike Strauss or whoever came before Beethoven. Um, this, it's just a generational uh, experience, shared generational experience. Um, and what happened in, in, for bands like the MC5 in, in the 60s is there was a whole new generation of fans, too. And the fans had the time and the money to come to shows. And there were places to play. Uh, Bill Graham, you know, the, the entrepreneur that founded the Fillmore's East and West, uh, was one of a handful of guys that were promoters. And they had these ballrooms all over the country. So all of a sudden, there was a place you could play. And people would want to come and gather at these places. Um, they were different than our parents' generation because they weren't nightclubs. They didn't serve booze. People came there mostly to smoke reefer and listen to the bands. 
And it was a, a, uh, the, the beginning of a, a cultural movement uh, across the country, and it, it brought in all kinds of music. Um, we were the house band at the Grandy Ballroom in Detroit, so we, we were the regular band, and then the touring bands would come through, so we would open for every band that toured. We opened for a Big Brother, and we opened for The Cream, and we opened for The Who, and we opened for Procol Harum, and we opened for um, uh, Canned Heat, we opened for Sly and the Family Stone, we opened for the James Cotton Blues Band. Because in those days, the, the criteria was, were you any good? See, today I think we've reached a point of ghettoization, of balkanization of, of musical taste, where everything in one group has to stay over here in this group, and everything in another style has to stay over here in this other group. But it wasn't, it, it wasn't always like that, and it wasn't like that on the radio either. Growing up in Detroit, um, we were exposed to all kinds of music on the radio, the only criteria being was the song a great song? Was the record a great record? So we would hear on the radio, Glenn Campbell segued into the Rolling Stones, segued into the Temptations, segued into Sergeant Barry Sadler, segued into Henry Mancini, segued into um, The Who. So it was just like all kinds of music would, would, we were exposed to. And um, this culture grew, and it grew exponentially every year. Every year, the record labels found out, since they controlled the distribution and production of vinyl, every year they sold more records. And every year they sold more records, they invested more money back into the industry. They signed new bands. And they encouraged the bands to be original in those days. Everybody was looking for the new sound, the original sound. That's why there's an explosion of creativity in those days. A um, lot of mediocrity. There's always mediocrity. Most, most popular culture is mediocre. I mean, let's don't be naive. <laughs> most of it's baloney. But it was encouraged to be original. And it grew every year. Every year more people came. People bought more records every year, year after year after year. And that encouraged um, artists to come into music and new artists to uh, emerge. And uh, popular music grew and grew and grew from kind of a cult thing where you know, it was just young people that, that were into music like to now today popular culture and popular music is ubiquitous. I mean, it's in every television show, every film score, uh, sporting events. You go to a sports event and you hear songs that you've heard, you know, a, th a million times on the radio before. So this this idea of culture has has uh, expanded and grown. I think almost to a, the point of saturation, to the point of diminishing returns. I think we're almost music out. We're we're inundated with it. We're overloaded with it. Um, I think the, the only thing that's significant about all that is, is the, the, the exponential growth of it. You know, what happened in the, in the music itself, in the culture, is discouraging because as the business aspect expanded, the creative aspect contracted. And this is, this is a result of uh, record companies who were run by music guys, record men, you know, the Jerry Wexlers and the Barry Gordys, uh, the Henry Stones in Miami, uh, Gamble and Huff in Philadelphia, on the West Coast, uh, the Wrecking Crew and all the producers of all the Sonny and Cher stuff, all these great rec, these guys, these people were record people, they loved music. But the industry became so successful that corporate raiders came in. And the corporate raiders started buying up companies. You know, that's what they do. They, you know, they, they, uh, they buy three or four companies, combine them together, fire half the staff, take half the profit, and hopefully it flies. And as that happened, the accountants 
and you know, we refer to them you know, cynically as bean counters. They started running record companies, and they didn't know about music, and they didn't care about music. What they cared about was how much did we profit this quarter. And then the creative aspect got narrower and narrower, and instead of getting wider and wider, it got narrower and narrower. And so today we end up, in my probably less than humble opinion, with music that's um, derivative. Everything sounds like everything else. You know, not to say that there isn't wonderfully creative music out there, but we gotta go find it now. Now we gotta get on the internet, and you know, if I'm interested in, in uh, you know, uh, gypsy music, I gotta go in there and find gypsy music. If I'm interested in, in uh, Czechoslovakian reggae music, I gotta get in there and find a website and find a band, a link to something else. It's out there. But we don't get it down the mainstream anymore. Today, what we get down the mainstream is oatmeal. That's actually not fair. I like oatmeal. But you know what I'm saying. It, it's, it, it, it lacks an individuality. It lacks a, a, a creativity. Um, so based on all that that I told you, I, I'm really curious to know what, what you guys are thinking about contemporary culture. because. Um, actually, I came here to learn from you. Uh, so uh, what I'd like, uh, what I'm going to propose is that we just open up the floor, and if anybody's done their homework and they've prepared some questions, terrific. Um, if you haven't prepared any questions and I've said something that didn't make sense or you think I'm full of baloney or uh, I'm not clear about something or there's something else on your mind, then I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to ask me about it. Um, so. If you just uh, want to, whatever, raise your hand and I'll be happy to, we'll just have a conversation. We'll just talk about this business of, of pop music and, and the history of it and how did we end up where we are today. What I'd like to suggest is if you ask a question, if you could repeat it so they could get it on the audio. That gotcha, great. gotcha. And one of the assignments that they are going to be doing that they don't know about next week is and this would go along with what you're talking about because we're talking about a generation from the 60s and one of the things that they're going to do is what will be the history of music of today <coughs> in books 50 years from mm -hmm. now. And that's an interesting concept that Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Who are those people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, we'll, we'll open it up. Yeah, it's a good one, yeah. <laughs> so I saw you had your hand up there. Um, have you listened to No Effects or Propaganda? When I listen to bands like No Effects and Epitaph bands and those kinds of bands, what do I hear? Yeah. What do I think of it? Um, for for those of you that don't know, you know this. You know about this band No Effects? People, yeah, fairly, yeah. Um, well, I like them. You know, they're, they're friends of mine, and and uh, and I appreciate what they do. Uh, I don't hear anything new. I don't hear anything that hasn't been done before. Uh, I, I think they do what they do with great enthusiasm and great spirit, and uh, I think what they do is, you know, worthwhile and valid, but it's not original. I just don't hear any, and I, I didn't hear anything original in the entire punk rock movement. And, you know, people, people either credit or blame the MC5 for punk rock, uh, some, you know, pundits do. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if I agree with it, but I always wondered, you know, if they think that the MC5 started punk rock, then how come none of them really heard what it was we were trying to do? Because what we were trying to do was sing our own song and come up with our own sound and our own approach to things. Whereas what I found in punk rock is uh, a lot of rules. And a lot of conformity. Like, I recorded for Epitaph Records. I made four albums for Epitaph. And, you know, you'd hang around that company and all these punk rockers, you know, like, you had to dress a certain way. And you had to have your hair a certain way. And you had to like certain music. And you couldn't talk about, the, you, they wouldn't let you talk about sex. They just wouldn't refer to it. They just, it was a non-subject. <laughs> and I, it's hard to separate music and sex for me, but. 
But uh, I, I noticed that I ended up with the sense that the people that on the outside looked like the raging anarchists that had all the tats and the freedom spikes and, and Doc Martens and all that stuff, it, they were inside, they were really conservative. And then I meet guys that, you know, look fairly conservative on the outside, and inside, he's a maniac. You know, his ideas are all over the place. So, uh, I, you know, I, I, what I appreciate about punk rock is um, the, the do-it-yourself concept that, you know, uh, even though it runs against my sensibilities as a musician, I appreciate the idea that you don't really know how, need to know how to play all that well that you can just get together with your friends and you just bang out some chords and you just have some fun and you, you just express yourself. I, I like that idea. I, th I think it's a cool idea. And I like the idea of punk as a rejection of the status quo. And I think that punk rock isn't the invention of punk because in that sense, the MC5 rejected the status quo. The free jazz artists of the 60s rejected the status quo. Elvis Presley rejected the status quo from before that. The big band guys, re, the small group jazz groups re, rejected the status quo of the big bands. The big bands rejected the status quo of um, the turn of the century music and on and on and on back through you know, uh, European music, Beethoven, uh, every generation rejects the status quo of the generation before it. Picasso rejected the status quo in the art world. I mean, it, it goes on and on. Punk as a concept, punk as an idea. I know that may have been more of an answer than you were looking for, but, <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting subject. Yeah. My my uh, my sense of what what what's happening with rap and and you know I'm 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 certainly not an expert, but my sense of it is that um, like a lot of great art, it came from the ground up. It came out of the street. Uh, uh, the experience of people, and it came out of uh, minimal technologies, you know, two turntables and a microphone in the Bronx. And, and it came, there's threads that go back into, um, you know, uh, African culture and Native uh, and uh, African American culture and signifying and poetry and boasting. Uh, that came together in rap and, and uh, with a defiance that was startling. <laughs> I mean, when N NW came out and said, fuck the police, I thought these were my children. <laughs> I said, right on. <laughs> you know, that, they were the new MC5 as far as I was concerned. And, and uh, they scared the bejesus out of white America, or part of white America, young, white America embraced them and spent billions of dollars on them and, and has bought into the, um, the, uh, the narrative of gangsterism and, uh, you know, I'm hard and I'm street and I'm keeping it real. And, you know, it's kind of like literature, you know, you like uh, thrilling adventure stories. Well, th that's what they are, they're thrilling adventure stories. Um, and I, th I, think, I think it was a great shot in the arm. I think that some great creative artists came out of it. Dr. Dre, I think, is a brilliant producer. Um, I, I think Timberland's a terrific innovator. I mean, he came up with beats that, you know, beats started getting tired. These guys use the same loops over and over and over. And Timberland came up, he syncopated the beats up, and he had different, uh, he had that, uh, that high-pitched uh, like piccolo snare in there, and it was, it was very slick, I thought. Um, it's, it's, it's all seemed that it got saturated to death to me, to the point where um, 
I don't, I'm surprised people still buy it. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's just like, oh. <laughs> yes, you're a gangster. <laughs> yes, you get bling and you got the bitches. And <laughs> you know, I mean, I know, I know a lot of people uh, take offense at it. I, you know, I don't because in, in my sense, you know, th this is the art world and this is, this is representations of life and, and extrapolations on life, just like in literature, just like in movies. And, but uh, I'm, 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 I think it's going to be curious to see what happens in, in, you know, in the next five years, what direction uh, all popular music will go in. In fact, the, the idea, which of these artists will be remembered 10 years from now, which of them historically will sustain over, over time, you know, in, in 100 years, if, we're, if humans still live on Earth and they look back, will they say Eminem was a great artist? I don't know. I mean, maybe. I think it's a good thing. You know, I like anything that's new and different. So they came up with their own song, their own sound. That's, I'm an advocate for that, the original thought. I think that each of us have uh, our own story. And if we can perfect our craft well enough, then we can tell our story, because it's, it's my story. My story is unique from your story. And if I can be honest enough in telling my story, I'll, it'll be original. It won't be so original that my story is all that much different than yours because we're all human beings and the level we connect on is the emotional level that I feel a certain way. And if I can, if I can express that honestly enough, then you might listen to it and say, well, gee, I feel like that too. I mean, that's what I hear when I hear a song and the song says something to me. I say, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's how I feel. It, I connect with it on an emotional level. Uh, so I think it's possible to do something new uh, within, the, within the parameters of, of popular music. I mean, uh, I, I think there's artists out there that are coming up with new ways to tell their story all the time. We just never hear about them because uh, record companies and, and movie studios aren't uh, looking for that. They're looking for something that sounds like what sold the last time. But I, I, yeah, I mean, Art is an ongoing, evolving, living life process. So um, you, your, your experience is, you're, there's going to be something in your experience that can show me something. That's all I'm ever looking for. Tell me your story. Tell me a story. May, you know, yeah, all the stories are the same. We're all humans. But tell me your story. That's what I want to hear. I want to hear the original story. So my answer is yes. <laughs> I saw you perform last year with Tom Morello on the Justice Tour at the House of Blues here. Um, I'm just curious, how did you originally get hooked up with Tom Morello because you're one of his heroes, as you well know? And, um, and what's it, that's first. And second, what's it like playing with him on stage? And third, um, how did the whole idea for the Justice Tour come up? Because I know that you two kind of did that together. How did I, how, how did I meet Tom and Rage Against the Machine? Uh, what's it like playing with him? <clears throat> And how did the Justice Tour come about? Uh, I was living in Los Angeles. I'd made some albums for Epitaph Records. Uh, I was looking for gigs so I could go out and promote my records. Um, I met Zach one night in a club. Uh, he was real curious about the White Panther Party. Wanted to know what was that all about. I think, I think he got... Uh, uh, confused when I told him, well, it started off as the MC5 fan club. Because <laughs> I think he had this kind of idealized, you know, political, militant, you know. And I said, well, it started as a fan club, and then we changed it over, and our rhetoric changed, and our attitude changed. 
And then I ran into, they, we all rehearsed at the same rehearsal studio. And then one day um, they were playing a show in Pomona and they said, well, Wayne, you want to come and open the show? And I was terrific because I get to play in front of their crowd. They were huge. And, and then backstage, we, I, I didn't really know much about them except that I liked them. I thought they sounded terrific and I liked their, their politics. And uh, I met Tom and we just seemed to connect politically, but just in general as, as humans, you know. And uh, over the years, uh, we would see each other at rehearsal or at a party or at a club or something. And, uh, and the more we talked, the more we found that we shared similar ideas about both music and politics and everything else, actually, that we basically had a, a, a not dissimilar worldview. Um, I think, I think we, we really locked in on my 50th birthday. I had a birthday party at the rehearsal studio. I rented out the whole rehearsal studio, and he came to the party, and uh, we really had a chance to talk. And uh, I, just, I just had my, uh, last year I had my 60th birthday, and he threw a party for me. We were on the justice tour. He gave me a, a Les Paul, which was very generous of him. But he's a very generous guy. So the second question, what's it like playing with him? Um, for me, it doesn't get much better. I mean, he is, uh, you know, we, we both, the, the truth about Tom, you know, he talks a good metal game. I mean, he loves metal. I mean, he's all about, you know, uh, Dorian modes and, you know, playing as fast as he can and he's metal, metal, metal. But when you play with him, he's actually a funk guitar player. The, the, the Kenyan in him comes out, and he's, he's dead in the pocket. He plays like a funk player. And I'm a funk player at heart. I mean, I, it's loud electric guitar, but my soul is in the funk. And I found we lock in together. I mean, we just shunk, you know, because we both play from the rhythmic perspective as opposed to how many notes can I play all at once, you know. So we really lock in, and he listens. When we play, he listens to what everybody else, he hears everything, and I try to listen. So it's really uh, fulfilling. I, very few guitar players that I play with um, are much fun to play with, because you're either battling them, uh, or they just, they, or they play too loud, or they play too quiet. They, the, very few of them can get up in the music with me. Um, not, not that I'm all that, but they just, their approach is different, you know. And the Justice Tour, uh, you know, Tom is an activist, I'm an activist, and we tried to figure out ways that we could um, bring attention to social justice issues from the perspective of being uh, rock musicians. And uh, so what we, he set up this tour and he was brilliant about it because he got big corporations to fund it. Google paid for it, and it allowed him to hire all, all of us, a whole bunch of musicians. Uh, none of us get paid, but we stay in nice hotels. We travel comfortably, and uh, we play a concert in every city, and we do a day of activism in every city. And the day of activism is aligned with a social justice group in each city. In New Orleans, we Last year, we uh, were with Sweet Home New Orleans. And so during the day, we went out and cleaned up Katrina debris. To me, this is a good idea. This is, this is like, this is way better than show business for me. To, to actually go out and help people is, is a good thing. And uh, something I, I have to do myself to stay right sized. And, uh, we give all the money from the gig and the merch to the social justice group, and we try to generate as much attention to that group in each city to show you that there is something you can do in your own city to help people, to help your fellows. And, and our motto is, you know, to feed the homeless, fight the power, and rock the fuck out. We just finished this year's justice tour and same thing, it was a ball we had. Cause it's interesting, all the musicians come out. Everybody wants to, 
once you set up a structure, everybody wants to get involved. We had, uh, in San Francisco, we had Sammy Hagar and Joe Satriani, Tom Morello, me, all playing guitars together. I mean, it, you know, for the people's price of $25, that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> Perry Farrell comes out with us. Steve Earle was out with us. It's a pretty, pretty terrific show. I got, I got, you know, they, they gave me a nickname, Chainsaw, because we got to this, we're, we're cleaning up this debris, and there's a jazz musician named uh, Frank Foster who died this year, but he's an older man and on dialysis, and a tree fell in his backyard, and so we arrive, and there's like 15 guys, the support band called uh, State Radio, and all their girlfriends, okay, we're here, we're ready to work, and there's a chainsaw, and everybody's like, oh my God, what do we do with that? You know, they're all, you know, they're musicians. <laughs> so I'm a carpenter too, so I know what has to give me the chainsaw. So I get the chainsaw, I'm cutting this tree down, or load this stuff up. <laughs> so from then on, they called me chainsaw. Thanks. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. So what do you think it was about what you guys did that still makes an impression on people today, especially like my generation who wasn't around when you guys were around, so we may not understand what motivated you. We don't understand the Vietnam era, so what right. is it about what you guys did that gets us excited? Yeah. <laughs> Why is it that the MC5 has sustained uh, interest in a following over these four decades since we came out? I think it has to do with the uncompromising commitment to what we were doing. That's captured in those records, the visceral commitment, the passion of totally crazed 19-year-olds. <laughs> I mean, out of our minds, you know, that absolute certainty of youth that we had, that what we were doing was righteous and it was going to it was going to make a difference, you know, and that, that we were doing righteous work and we couldn't be stopped. Can't stop us. And I think, that the, I think that's what comes across, that enthusiasm. Uh, you could call it uh, maybe original joy. You know, the thing that happens on a great night when you're on the gig and just somebody plays something and somebody else plays something and, and you play something a little and, man, something just... Whew, Wow, did you hear that? Yeah, <laughs> you know, or you're in the, on a session and somebody's playing something and all of a sudden everything just falls into place and it's like, wow. And you know, great records all get this, this concept of original joy, which is tough because you can't hold on to joy. You can grab a kiss as it passes by. And you know, when we're recording, if you, can, if you can get that take, that's got that original joy. So I think there's a little bit of that somewhere in those records. And I think uh, over time that, that uh, you know, un see the fact that the MC5 didn't succeed actually helps it sustain <laughs> because um, it's locked in time as this uncompromising, never sold out uh, idea. See, I've actually been trying to sell out for years. Nobody's been buying. Uh, it's both, because uh, at some point uh, you have to make a Faustian deal with the gatekeepers. But on what terms do you make that deal? Do you make them on the best terms for you or the best terms for them? And if you're focusing on playing to the industry in the beginning, it's going to be on the best terms for them. And uh, so my sense of it is, for an emerging artist, is today you can get Pro Tools, you can make your own records, you can produce them yourself, 
You can sell your music on the internet. You can press up CDs that you can sell at your gigs. I say, do that this year. Then do that again next year. And then do that again next year. And do that for five years. Have five albums worth of music that you own. You own the publishing. You own the masters. Then, at the end of five years, I'm saying you want to do this for a living. You want to have a career in the arts. At the end of five years, which is not that long, um, you've built a following. Over five CDs, you're going to build a following. People will find you. They will they'll present themselves to you. You'll build up, and, and you'll get better at your craft. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll learn how to play music that's more compelling. You'll learn how to write music that's more compelling. Um, at a certain point, that you reach a kind of saturation point where the gatekeepers, they'll find you. Because now they want what you got. Now you can make a better deal with them. Because what you're going to do is you need them to build a brand. You can build a brand pretty good by yourself, putting out your own stuff, five albums. You could do 10 albums and be even in better shape. Have 10 albums worth of material. Um, but then when you make the deal with them, A, you know a lot more about deals. You've, you've learned something about marketing music, so you know how to police them. You know how to task them. And you know enough about contracts to um, make sure that the percentages are in your favor better. They're never going to be in your favor, but more in your favor. Certainly more than you would be if, you, if all you did is tried to get a major company to sign you. Especially today with the 360 deals that they talk about. I mean, they want the whole pie. They don't want the biggest slice. They want the pie. They want the stove. They want the whole kitchen. You know? <laughs> so I, I'd say it's both. You know, you've got to, you've got to have an awareness of, that they exist, you know, that that's, because they've got the millions to put into marketing you on a massive scale. But also, you don't want to pay with, with your, you know, the rest of your career for that. It's tricky stuff. It's tricky stuff. I, the most important thing is, is I think, uh, for you to continue on your own path. And they'll come to you. They'll find you. G I guarantee it. <laughs> they need you, because they can't do what you do. If they could do what you do, then what do they need you for? They can't. Talk a little bit about the White Panthers and your ah. connection with John Sinclair. Yes. The MC5 was uh, unmanageable on every level, personally, business-wise, creatively, because we were just defiant hoodlums. Um, and we looked at it like having a ban was a way either not to go to jail or not to go to the factory. And uh, it, it almost worked, except I ended up going to jail anyway. <laughs> A <laughs> uh, couple of us did, actually. Um, we tried to get managers. You know, at a certain point, an artist needs representation because artists really, it's difficult to represent yourself. It's difficult to advocate for yourself in a, in a business setting as an artist. You know, they really are more comfortable with seeing you as the beautiful, creative genius in the background who just does that magical thing that you do. And then they can talk to the manager about, you know, this is only worth 7.5%. Well, OK, 8.5%. Well, no, 6 and a half. You know, they can do that. It's hard to do it with you as an artist. Given that, we needed a manager. We had two or three managers who were show business people. And it didn't work. <laughs> we just couldn't get along with them. They would tell us incredibly offensive things like, listen, you're no exalted talent. There's a hundred bands like you. I said, well, if I'm no exalted talent, what are you talking to me for? If I'm not special, then what are we doing here? And then we met this guy, Sinclair, and he was like we were. He was crazy, and he was a poet, and he was brilliant. And he heard what we were doing, and he understood the kind of problems that we had, and he could talk to us without insulting us, and talk to us, you know, as a as a peer, and even as a mentor. You know, he was a little older than me; he's better educated than me, and uh, so I kind of 
talked him into being the manager. <laughs> and he had just, he met Rock Scully and these guys that managed this band on the West Coast called the Grateful Dead. And they, they said, well, John, we don't know anything about being a manager either. I mean, you go to these record companies and they give you money, so I guess that makes us a manager. So he said, well, Rock's, Rock did it, so I guess I could do it. And so he became our manager. And he was good because it was a layer of insulation between the band and the world. Because <laughs> the band needed to be insulated from, and the world needed to be insulated from the band. And John was mature enough to be able to talk to people and negotiate contracts for gigs and get us booked and, and got a van so we could get places on time and uh, rehearse. And, uh, but this is all in the context of the 60s, and uh, like we were talking about the Vietnam War era and the Civil Rights Movement. And there was this uh, sense that things were wrong in America and things uh, were out of kilter and, and that it, what was happening was really immoral and illegal. And I, I felt like as a patriot, a, a, as a human being, I needed to do something about this. And uh, the era of activism was exploding in young people. The, a, a movement was building, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the movement. And we read in the Black Panther Party newspaper that Huey Newton called for a formation of a White Panther Party to do parallel work in the white hippie community that the Black Panthers did in the black community. And we said, that's us. Black Panthers got guns, we got guns. Shoot it out, we'll shoot it out. Off the pig, off the pig. We loved all that rhetoric. It was, it was uh, macho and, you know, made us feel bad. We, we were bad. And we, and we especially liked their clothes, Black Panther Party. They look good, huh? black leather jackets, berets, sunglasses. It's a cool look. Um, but the, the, I think at its core, the White Panther Party was a way to express our frustration with the slow pace of change. We wanted change, and it wasn't happening fast enough. And so we thought we would, um, poke the beast in the belly a little bit, you know, and aggravate him some more. And uh, we made some mistakes. And the big mistake was that we endorsed um, the idea of violence. And we endorsed the image of the gun. And we, I had my photo taken with an electric guitar and the American flag and a machine gun. And we endorsed all, all that kind of macho rhetoric. And um, we didn't think that through well enough. Because in retrospect, I know now, once you use the language and the images of violence, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. And you don't know where that's going to play out, how that's going to play out. I mean, look at in the rap community that endorses all that imagery. A lot of guys get shot. Tupac, Biggie, a lot of guys we never heard of get shot. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's destructive, and I didn't know it, and none of us really knew it at the time. We were really angry. We were frustrated and we were angry, and it, it seemed like a good idea at the time. You know, some, somebody blew up the CIA office in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I didn't plant the bomb, but somebody did. So when I look back on it, I say that was a mistake. And, and that caused some breakup in uh, our relationship with Sinclair and the White Panther Party. The band was purged from the party because we, we uh, felt that uh, violence was uh, self-defeating. But you know that was the era that we lived in, and those were the those were those times. And uh, uh, you know, it's easy to look back and say, "I wish it would have been different." Well, I, I don't wish it would have been different. Uh, I wish less people had been harmed. But you, you end up with a situation where the you know 
we're kind of in this because it's exciting and glamorous and we're angry, but the police are shooting real bullets and real Black Panthers get really murdered by police departments, death squads all over America. What it got the White Panther Party was kick, got the MC5 kicked out of the music business because all these guys want to do is make money. They're, they're not, they don't want to get involved in any of this guns and blowing shit up and <laughs> they're, try, they're trying, they're businessmen, they just want to make money. And uh, it got us, you know, court cases, indictments, uh, imprisonment, a couple, couple of our, our crew went to prison, the penitentiary uh, and, and basically uh, led to the unwinding of, and the undoing of the MC5 as a rock band. That kind of culminated in that. It has an arc. It goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, do you still do all your jam track dance moves on stage? I, you know, I'm not a 19-year-old anymore, but I'm in relatively good shape, and uh, I bust the move. Yeah. <laughs> I can dance. I'm a dancer. John uh, is a completely out of the closet advocate for marijuana use, as were we all in those days. And um, he got arrested in Detroit um, in the 60s by a uh, undercover police officer. And John was a poet and he wrote a poem about this policeman and he published it. It was called The Poem for Warner Stringfellow. That was the policeman's name. And it was a scathing indictment of Warner Stringfellow as a man and as he represented all the anti-marijuana thinking in America. And uh, Warner didn't like it much and vowed to get John and in fact busted him again. Then Busted him a third time. Sent an undercover policewoman in to flirt with him, and John gave her two joints. And in those days, the, the conviction for possession of marijuana on a third offense was nine and a half to 10 years in state prison, mandatory. And uh, we, when we met John, I met John the day he was released from the, Depart the Detroit House of Corrections. Dehoko, uh, after his second bust. He did six months on that one. And so he had this third case pending, 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 and ultimately uh, was convicted and sentenced to nine and a half to 10 years in prison. And uh, it, it it was a very hard time for me personally, and needless to say, a hard time for John and his family. Um, and John, I don't know if you guys know anyone that's ever gone to prison, but oftentimes people freak out just before they go to jail. <laughs> it's a kind of traumatic thing to have happen to you. And uh, John kind of felt like the MC5 sold him out, like we sold him down the river because I was trying to arrange for representation for the band in the eventuality that John would go to prison. And that ain't what he heard. What he heard was, I'm firing you, John, because you're going to jail. And it's just an it's just a odd human miscommunication. But that's the way he heard it. And we exchanged letters back and forth, and it was pretty vitriolic, and it was, it was pretty mean-spirited, and it was, it was pretty hard on, on me, personally. After two years, um, the Free John Sinclair movement built momentum, and the White Panther Party, which had now evolved into the, Ra the Rainbow People's Party, because they started to realize the gun thing wasn't going to work, um, 
put on a benefit concert in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the Chrysler Arena and drew over 20,000 young people. And uh, Bobby Seale from the Black Panther Party came and spoke. And uh, Stevie Wonder played and Bob Seeger played. And um, John Lennon and Yoko Ono came. And John Lennon wrote a song about John Sinclair. And the line was, it ain't fair, John Sinclair, locked in stir for breathing air, and brought international attention to John's case. And a week later, the Michigan Supreme Court agreed with us that nine and a half to 10 years in prison for two joints was cruel and unusual punishment and unconstitutional. So John was released. And just as a footnote, you know, my life had gone down the drain at the end of the MC5, and I slipped and slipped and slipped into the criminal underworld and had been uh, arrested a number of times and uh, was indicted on a drug conspiracy charge and was getting ready to leave for prison myself just as John was coming out. And we met up, and it was if, as if I was forgiven or all was forgiven because I was going to go to jail too. <laughs> it's kind of weird like that. But um, that's what happened, and, and uh, John and I have been tight ever since then. It was like somehow it all balanced out. You know, He went down for just over two years, then I went down for just over two years, and somehow it, it, it evened out. And uh, we have uh, remained uh, dearest friends, and he's still my great mentor and, uh, and brother. I appreciate him a great deal. Tell us a little bit about after all of this and what you did in the industry and how you recultivated, you know, your playing and in the, being in the industry. Sure. Making a living. In, uh, after I got out of prison, you know, uh, I, I, I tried real hard. You know, we haven't talked much about, how late do we go here? 15 more minutes. Yeah, we haven't talked much about... Uh, addiction and how that fits into the pop culture. Uh, I was an alcoholic and a drug addict. I'm still an alcoholic and a drug addict. I'm a sober alcoholic and I'm a clean drug addict. I'll always be an alcoholic and a drug addict. Um, but today, all day, I probably won't drink and probably won't take drugs today, all day. Pretty sure I can get through today. Um, so I struggled with addiction for a couple decades after prison um, and really didn't do much. Nothing got read, nothing got written. You know, I'd play, people would call me to come and play guitar, I'd play guitar, I'd produce a band, I made a couple singles, uh, I lived in New York City. But mostly, I chased a bag of heroin and a bottle of vodka, or Old English 800. And the singer and the other guitarist from the MC5 both died in 19, the early 90s, both at 46, which is young. Both drank themselves to death, never survived having been in the MC5. And their deaths told me that my time is finite that I'm not going to live forever, because here's my two partners, and I did more drugs and alcohol than both of them, and they're dead. They're six feet under, and I'm not. And my time, if I look at it, it's going to go till somewhere around 70, 75, maybe 80, if I'm lucky, and then that's it. I'm out of here. See ya. That's it. So what am I going to do? I'm ambitious. I got a lot I want to do. I better get to work. So I moved to Los Angeles where my job skills would be marketable. I realized at my age, the, the, the myth of the dream of being a famous rock musician probably slipped over to the younger crowd now. But I'm still viable. I can play. I can write. I'm, I'm creative. I can do things. I can make things happen in the world. Maybe I could do music for film and television. 
That's where they do it in Los Angeles. I went out there, still, ha still had a foot in the record business, signed with Epitaph, made four albums for them, started a label of my own, thought maybe with my experience I could advocate for up and coming emerging artists. That was a good experiment. Uh, became a, a published songwriter for a pu big publishing house in Los Angeles and steady looking towards film and TV. Because I started to see that, that um, it was the appropriate thing for me at this stage of my fine, fine career <laughs> in show business. And um, you know, this is a business of relationships. And I started to meet people that worked at television networks, meet people that worked at film studios and found that I brought some equity with me, that they were, in fact, MC5 fans. You know, most people out in the world don't know about the MC5, but people in the industry know about the MC5. And found that sometimes, because I was Wayne Kramer from the MC5, I got to go to the front of the line. Unfortunately, I have to bring a suitcase with me when I go to the front of the line, and that's all the MC5 baggage. See, they expect me to be the guy that was in the MC5 and play the music that I played in the MC5. And in the meantime, I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to, to become a composer. So I do what you guys do. I go to school. I've been going to school for the last five years. I take theory courses. I take orchestration courses. I take film composing courses. I take sight singing courses. Whenever I got time, I'll go take a course. I want to write for the orchestra. I got to do what every other composer does. He goes to school. He's got to learn the language of the orchestra. As time has gone on, occasionally uh, something will break loose for me. I, I, someone that works at Fox Sports, they were a fan of mine. They said, would you like to write some music for sports, for television? I said, absolutely. <laughs> Are you crazy? It was a great gig. I, I did seven albums for Fox Sports. When you hear baseball games or basketball games on television on Fox Sports, that's my stuff you're hearing in there. I wrote some of that music. They have other composers that wrote it. That helped me meet other people. Um, I met a guy. Wanted to make a documentary film for HBO. and. Uh, I said, who's the composer? And he said, well, we've got a European guy. I said, well, I'd like to do this, you know. He said, OK. So all of a sudden, I'm composing music for an HBO show. It was called Hacking Democracy. It was an examination of the Diebold voting machine scandal. Pretty successful documentary. I've, I met some people in the movie business. You know, I got to work on some films. Uh, a guy asked me, they had another composer on the movie, but he couldn't rock. He was real good with the orchestra, but he couldn't rock. Well, I'm all about the rock. I said, I think I could do that part of the, they needed, the movie was Talladega Nights, Will Ferrell comedy, and they needed rock music for all the race scenes, and the guy they had couldn't write it. So I said, I was pretty sure I could, pretty sure I could do that for you. I liked the guy, he liked me, he asked me to write for his next movie, Step Brothers. I wrote some stuff for that. And, and right now, today, they, they hooked up with some young filmmakers who got a deal with HBO and they produced a show and they asked me to score it called Eastbound and Down. And that's, I do that show today. So I'm more alive today. I'm having a ball. I get to do what I want to do with people I want to do it with almost all the time. Not all the time, but almost all the time. And, and uh, I've got a, a great deal of, uh, of uh, gratitude uh, to, be, to be able to do the, the kind of stuff I do. Um, that's, that's basically my story, and I'm sticking to it. But we have a little, little bit more time if there's anything else you, you want to talk about. I'd like to thank you for taking the time because most of the people that come to the forums and meet the music industry people come in, talk, and they might do a few more things. But you're really 
putting out an effort to, you know, touch these kids. And I really appreciate. We all appreciate that. Thanks. I, I'm, maybe you know, maybe. Maybe I've said something that um, will help. I hope so. Um, I kind of doubt it. Because <laughs> if you're anything like me, you got it all figured out already. <laughs> and I, uh, somebody will go to say something, you'll say, yeah, I know that. Oh, I knew that. Oh, I know that. And the mind closes. Slam shut. And, and uh, I, f what a, a principle that I try to live by is the principle of the open mind. And I used to think I had an open mind because I had leftist political ideas and I had gay friends and I believed in UFOs. That's not an open mind. <laughs> open mind is no preconceived ideas. That somebody can tell me something and I just let it lay on my mind. And I don't have to judge it. I don't have to make a decision about it. I just let it lay there. And if what I heard was true, that'll be revealed to me. If it was a lie, that'll also be revealed to me. But it saves me the bother of having to figure it out and have a decision about it. Because otherwise, without an open mind, nothing new comes in. And you know, we're in the idea business here. And for, to be in the idea business, to traffic in ideas has to be a flow. The tide has to come in and the tide can go out. And that requires uh, having an open mind, you know. It, it's, uh, it's, it's funny, my, my wife sometimes, she'll, say, she'll hear a record, and, and she's in the music industry, and she'll say, I hate that. That stinks. Uh, how could you hate, what do you know? <laughs> how do you hate a piece of music? I, I mean, you may not, it may not be your thing, may not speak to you, but I, I can't hate it. I got to keep an open mind about it. So take it easy, but take it. Thank you, Wayne. Appreciate You're welcome. It.